Our second firm presenting tonight is Neme Studio, which is based in Emeryville, California, and was founded by Mete San Sanmez and Neyran Turan in 2009. Neyran is an assistant professor of architecture at the University of California, Berkeley. She received a Doctor of Design from Harvard GSD, a Master of Environmental Design from Yale University School of Architecture, and a Bachelor of Architecture from Istanbul Technical University. Mete holds a Master of Architecture from Harvard GSD and a Bachelor of Architecture from Istanbul Technical University. In addition to his work at Neme Studio, he is also Director of Design at Page in San Francisco. In their submission, they focused on how architecture could be understood. They write, architecture is both a background and a measure against which the world might be read, and that their work aims at slightly unfamiliar interpretations of temporality, flexibility, and legibility. Please join me in welcoming Neyran and Mete. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for being with us tonight. Um, first, we would like to thank Architectural League, and especially to Anne, Matt, and Marta for their amazing work for orchestrating all this. Um, thank you also to our fantastic team at Neme Studio, to Suhan, Keenan Gravier, Alex Patsir, and Darcy Spence for all their work for this installation, and to everyone who collaborated with us for various kinds of projects within the last couple of years. We are an architectural office that produces work ranging from buildings and installations to speculative projects in various scales. Our speculations in the office draw on the cultural and disciplinary potentials that are made possible by somewhat archaic, yet still very powerful architectural problems, such as form, representation, and materiality, and the unconventional collision of these problems with broader concerns of the city, environment, and geography. More recently, our work revolves around the idea of what we call the slightly unfamiliar. By that, we mean the subtle aesthetic tension between reality and abstraction in order to achieve a much deeper and nuanced engagement with reality. Here, we're thinking, for instance, as seen on the left, of photographer Laurent Marsoulier's slightly distorted realisms of everyday life in her digital collages and is seen on the right of Roxy Payne's reproduction of the banal in his scaled diorama of a fast food kitchen produced entirely from birch and maple wood. For us, what both of these works share is a small degree of abstraction that renders familiar objects a bit unfamiliar. The slight distortion or abstraction enables us to re-engage with reality even more. This idea of the slightly unfamiliar is tested in two ways in our work. On the one hand, we're invested in experimenting on the unfamiliar interpretations of what is considered to be familiar, ordinary, or banal architectural elements, such as the typical plants, suburban track homes, shotgun houses, or big box, warehouses, big box warehouses, and other forms of commonplace or vernacular architectural production that are not simply <laughs> foregrounded, but are understood with a renewed rigor. On the other hand, in an, expand, in an attempt to expand our disciplinary imaginary, we're interested in speculating on the use of familiar architectural strategies on what is considered to be unfamiliar within a disciplinary setting, such as the territorial geometries of agricultural and resource extraction fields, geographies of resource and matter, and geological layers of the earth, etc., and bringing them into architectural consciousness. Our Museum of Lost Volumes project, for instance, aims to tackle such questions. As a geo-architecture fiction and a satire commentary on resource extraction, it provides an alternative focus on the mining of rare earth minerals. Rare earth minerals are a group of 17 chemical elements which are the backbone substance used in clean energy technologies, such as wind turbines, electric car batteries, solar panels, and energy efficient light bulbs. In this context, the project questions the idea of resource scarcity in the abundance of green technologies. The project tells the story of an imaginary future where all the rare earth minerals are depleted in the world because of their excessive use of these green technologies. This marks the end of the zero carbon hedonistic era, and no more mining of rare earth elements happens after this time. 
The project imagines a museum for preserving and commemorating resource extraction ruins for a time when mining is an obsolete practice and treated similarly to an ancient monument or an extinct species to be housed in a museum. This room of the museum that you're staying showcases inverted pieces of rare earth mines, for instance, that are placed in preserved glass boxes. Juxtaposing an inquiry on modern and resource with monumentality, the project renders the geographic scale as a tangible entity through the limits and potentials of design thinking. Here, for instance, you're seeing a section of the museum that is dedicated to the museum's The Grand Tour, an excursion of several one-to-one -one scale rare earth replicas. And finally, this section of the museum you're seeing was divided into three parts and is connected with a single bridge that looks over the three different minerals. While the mines were placed into the underground, exhibiting the extraction processes of how they were removed from the earth, the visitors walked through the bridge, observing them. In his seminal 1967 study, geographer Clarence Glacken writes that there have been three main geographic ideas in ancient, since the ancient Greece, a designed earth, environmental influence, and the idea of a human as a geographic agent. More recently, this question is challenged by the idea of the Anthropocene. Deriving from the Greek roots anthropo, meaning human, and scene, meaning new, Anthropocene is presented as a distinct geological era that is marked decisively by the human terraforming of the Earth's surface. The proposition is that the changes brought to the planet by humans have become so prominent that they should establish a new geological epoch. According to this formulation, humans are now described not only as geographic, but also as geological agents. To call human beings as geological agents, as historian Deepesh Chakrapari argues, quote, is to scale up our imagination of the human, unquote. In the context of the debates on climate change and the Anthropocene, the Museum of Los Volumes project positions architecture, both as a background and then as a measure against which the world might be read. Like architecture then, the project represents the world back to itself. Engaging in conversations such as the climate change forces architecture to embrace the potentials of permanence and rethink the idea of flexibility. With this in mind, we would like to talk about two other projects that we're currently working on, which look at the idea of longevity or long span. We will expand on the idea a little bit before talking about these two projects. For this, consider two images. First, as seen on the left, is the plan drawing of Carla Fontana's 1725 project for the erection of a church on the arena of the Colosseum Amphitheater in Rome, which turns the oval organization of the existing plan into a centralized building arranged around circular passages. Second, as seen on the right, is a recent photograph of a plastic glomerate, a neologism for a new kind of stone proposed by geologists and oceanographers. This rock is hardened by molten plastic and natural debris and presented as a marker of human impact on the Earth's geology. When positioned next to one another, these two images put forward an important coupling of two different dimensions of longevity for us. First image shows the expanded lifespan of a particular building after its original use and its inherent capacity for flexibility despite its programmatic obsolescence. Second image, on the other hand, illustrates the idea of material long span, but its latent yet elongated temporality. Given our contemporary, contemporary environmental, political, and economic crisis, architecture might seem to need the most impermanence almost at the risk of disappearing. However, instead of associating impermanence with temporality and permanence with solidity and inflexibility, we are interested in more expanded associations that come with these terms. Perhaps similar to a polyestrine coffee cup or a takeout box, whose usage time is perhaps the most ephemeral, sometimes perhaps less than an hour, but who will be on the surface of the earth after 500 years, we believe that our objects, geographies, and geologies might need to be reimagined within longer span of time and larger span of earth. In that context, we're interested in the relevance of these questions for architecture. First project, titled Nine Islands, engages with the question of long span from a material point of view. The project is an installation that we're developing for the Istanbul Design Biennial this fall. It examines the under-conceptualized un, under relationship between architecture materiality and resource geographies. 
An article we encountered during our research created an important background for the project. In a 1972 architectural design article on then recently built 50-story One Shell Plaza in Houston, a description was provided for the lavish materials coming from every part of the planet for the building, ranging from primavera mahogany wood from Guatemala, Italian traversing quarried near Rome, and Persian walnut wood from Iran. Among these, the article's description of one particular material drew our attention the most. For the 26, ele 26 elevator caps of the building that each had nine feet walls covered with real leather, the article wrote that, quote, the architects wanted no seams or joints horizontally, so they had to search the world for nine foot cows, unquote, the biggest at the time. This led us to question how we understand materials of architecture in relation to their resources today. From the extraction of raw matter from a specific geographic location to their processing, transportation, and construction into a desired finished effect on the building, and finally, to its demolition, waste, and decomposition, the Nine Islands Project explores the spatial and temporal span of architecture materiality. The installation consists of an archipelago of nine islands, presented through five feet tall models on pedestals, each complemented by one drawing. Each island represents a particular lavish building material, such as leather, marble, wood, glass, travertine, gold, limestone, steel, or granite. The upper part of each island consists of an archetypical building form, each of which achieved through the elementary extrusion of primitive shapes, coated with the associated material. As an opposition to the upper part, the lower part of each island contains a formal land mass, or the source from which the raw matter is extracted. Quarry for the marble, tree for the wood, cows for the leather, etc. This stark contrast between the finished surfaces of the archetypical forms at the top with the vulgar formlessness of the naked resource origins below aims to call attention to the long span in between. Second project, titled Six Objects, 36 Plans, engages with the question of long span, this time with a particular focus on flexibility. The, process, the project consists of six medium-scale building proposals, uh, which investigate flexibility through the variation of certain plan typologies, such as the enfilade plan, the open plan, the hypostyle plan, to inhabited wall plan. Why each building is composed of deviations from a specific plan typology with six plan iterations, because of their various proportions of parameters, such as service versus open space area or structure versus aperture, each building offers a particular spectrum of flexibility, despite perceived as a permanent structure. Here, with object one, for instance, a flat plan on the ground level turns into an open plan on the top. Here, with object two, the building starts with open plan and transitions into hypostyle columns with poche space becoming infrastructure. And here, with object three, this elongated shear walls on the top levels transition into habitable wider spaces on the ground level. Here we see the second floor plan of the object three in further detail. The poche space get wide enough to accommodate micro units and necessary building infrastructures in the case of a shared living program. On the fifth floor of the same building, we're showing here a co-work space. And here's the section of the building with spaces ranging in size providing a spectrum of flexibility. While the most familiar architecture notion of the typical plan is, studies in this, is studied in this project, at the same time, we question and research inherent flexibility in various plan typologies. Okay. Well, um, as Nera mentioned at NEMIS Studio, we are interested in the idea of slightly unfamiliar. We've been experimenting on this very idea through some of our recent commissioned and client-based projects as well often by foregrounding certain familiar architectural elements. I will talk briefly about a couple of those projects. For instance, in our all glass uh, porcupine pavilion project in Houston, we emphasize the structure glass facade via serration. Essentially using this technique not only helped us to increase the structure efficiency of the glass enclosure to withstand lateral forces of the potential storms, but also provided varying degrees of transparency as the reflection transformed the angled glass. On our HRBG project, on the other hand, that we are currently working on, we were asked to renovate a warehouse design and a new co-work office building right adjacent to it. Here we investigated a new shed roof typology with differing 
profiles which became at the end a new unifying element that spanned over two buildings, old and new. And we also utilize a very familiar facade material, brick, especially in the context of Houston, but made it entirely from a leftover, from leftover brick in various colors, various different colors and textures from our contractors' previous constructions, enabling a distinct graphic uh, reading at a very low cost budget. Now I'm gonna talk about two houses a bit in a bit more detail uh, that both represents our sensibilities on this topic. Um, on our LV house project, which was commissioned as part of, a, a part of an affordable housing initiative in Houston, we particularly looked at the gable roof element and revisited the shotgun house typology. Um, providing maximum airflow within its elongated interior space with passive um, cooling properties, shotgun house has been the most prominent low income housing typology in the southern United States during the um, 19th and early 20th centuries. Here, we started with this um, iconic simplicity of the shotgun type and experimented on its potential by multiplying and doubling the profile. The project challenges, essentially challenges the traditional shotgun form by introducing a planar twist in the middle of the project site. Basically, by pushing the back of the house off center, this twist allows for a larger outdoor space in the back within the constricted lot and also creates a new spatial division within the larger interior space. A typical gable roof profile is extruded longitudinally from front to back and is sheared laterally in the middle. This shearing essentially introduces a new fascia on the sides and creates a doubling effect from the street elevation. Here we start to see this new legibility on the street elevation. And here we see the plants, just as similar to a typical shotgun house, we try to minimize and actually avoid to use um, hallways as much as possible. Um, this is another house we were fortunate enough that the same developer wanted to work with us again. And um, this house uh, was, or is located in um, uh, East Austin, Texas, and it is designed as a three bedroom, single family house as part of an artist. Uh, housing community. Um, well, here we were intrigued by this interesting phenomena happening in Houston uh, currently. Um, the towers in downtown Houston mostly were built in the 70s and 80s uh, with lavish materials and spaces at the height of Houston's energy boom. Uh, most of these towers, just like one shell plaza that Nera mentioned earlier, are going through reno extensive renovations to reposition themselves. Uh, to attract more tenants and increase their occupancy. Well, for this, they try to reinvent their interior space, usually by discarding all these lavish materials that they have in, the, in their lobby, travertine or granite, whatever that might be. Once representing a sense of luxury and extravagance, these materials are now seen as the ultimate indication of an outdated looking lobby spaces for the owners and the real estate uh, agents alike. At this juncture, we wanted to repurpose these marbles on the AG house. Um, so essentially, this is, this is basically to highlight a delicate line in between what's considered outdated or familiar or the luxurious for us. The building, the building uses um, symmetry and primitive geometry in its design. The use of ang angled fascia enhances the frontality by enlarging the facade, which in return allows for more daylight penetration. By mirror mirroring the second floor over the first floor, the building introduces canopies and patios on both levels, as well as um, new interstitial spaces overlooking the double height section. In contrast to the spatial depth suggested by the front and back, suggested by the front and back that helps to transfer light and air, Side elevations of the house have a more flattened and solid look. Um, well, shortly after we started working on the project, we were told by the developer that uh, this building can be uh, multiplied and uh, to actually be built some other locations as well, as they wish. So we took uh, this as an opportunity to create this drawing, not only to showcase the potential aggregations of AG house replications, but also the sheer amount of available materials, discarded available materials from Houston downtown. Um, for the 
for the last section of the lecture, we would like to end with two projects that further illustrate our interest in uh, the relationship between geography and <coughs> architecture. This relationship has been a recurrent theme in our work, presented in various formats. Neran, uh, particularly, um, um, has worked on this topic uh, quite extensively, and she is the founding editor-in-chief for New Geographies magazine, and she, um, uh, and she and I in the office, uh, we expand on this topic um, in order to bestow an alternative agency for architecture. Well, an earlier project from 2012 um, um, looks at this idea. Um, it's called Typo Project, and it introduces a new role for architecture at the territorial scale by proposing a group of collective institutions for the university campuses in Istanbul. Um, so here we propose a new framework in which the public and the private educational um, educational entities collaborate on a new sharing model for university resources. So in contrast to a typical university model where a campus belongs to a university, in this model uh, we propose a new uh, shared campus typology, each containing many universities in one location. To do this, we situate the project between two well-known urban design models, a master plan and a collection of point interventions. So this model, what we call master framework, accommodates certain features of both models, but proposes a hybrid approach with an open and flexible structure. So for this um, project, two precedents were really influential for us. Um, first is the architect Matthias Ungers' uh, nuanced calibration of diversity and unity that existed in these projects from the 70s. And the second one was the abstract and elemental language of the territorial and iconic cutouts of Sol Levitz, a square of Chicago without a circle and triangle. So likewise, we speculate that the territories can have forms and that they can offer a very different level of legibility and monumentality. So positions positioned along the existing and future lines of major rail transit stops, the project proposes nine separate interventions located in the city center, at the urban edge, and in the ecological zones. Each campus intervention defines a legible territorial frame within its existing context. Through this context, we demark the newly appropriated campus buildings. This territorial frame acts as an open and porous edge for the redefined void inside and reimagines very small public parks um, and related programs. Um, these strategies are tested and applied in other locations as well. Um, and it is basically based on the given context. Um, here, for instance, we look at another campus situation by a major railway in more detail, and here are the old uh, large auditoria within that uh, structure, and here is a view towards the inner void. Well, in the end, um, the type of project can be taught as an experiment, really, um, on more nuanced relationship between monumentality and legibility at the um, territorial scale. Um, our recent straight installation exploits similar contrastations between the geographic and the architectural. By presenting a geographical feature as a withdrawn monolith, it aims to open up a range of aesthetic and political concerns for architectural imagination and the broader public. The installation was viewed at the Salt Gallery in Istanbul last summer. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a background for the project. In March 1994, a dramatic accident occurred in the Basra Strait of Istanbul. A 100,000 ton tanker carrying crude oil from Russia collided with a cargo ship at the northern exit of the strait. The cargo ship exploded and ran aground, while the oil tanker immediately caught fire and released more than 13,000 13, tons of oil into the sea. The fire continued for weeks, causing a devastating environmental disaster. This accident marked a delicate moment in the history of the Basra Strait. 
After the collapse of the Soviet Union and the opening of the Caspian oil reserves in the 90s, the Strait became one of the six busiest oil shipping choke points in the world. Compared to the other routes, trade routes, however, the Bosphorus is unique as one of the narrowest and the most urbanized, as it passes through the heart of Istanbul, a city of 14, 14 million citizens. To complicate matters even further, the geographic form of the strait, with its sharp and narrow turns, makes it one of the most risky and difficult channels to navigate in the world. Despite the seriousness of the environmental risk, contemporary environmental concerns regarding the transit of coal's colossal oil tankers through this navigational route have been conflicted with the controversies around transnational energy pipelines and various other large-scale infrastructural and urban transformation projects. The straight installation brings this framework to architectural and urban imaginaries by manifesting the narrow strait through the tangible experience of an installation object. Invading the entrance floor of the gallery as an out-of-scale monolith, the installation introduces the idea of the geographic object as an extrusion of the Bosphorus Strait shoreline to the height of the gallery ceiling without articulating its actual topography. While the uh, object is scaled, so the tightest point in the strait measured 90 centimeters, which is the minimum dimension for a door opening, the visitor's pathway through the installation evokes the narrowness of the Bosphorus Strait through architectural language. In this way, the object renders the Bosphorus as a constricted experiential condition. To amplify the contestation between architectural and geographic scales, the installation reconstruct reconstructs the crenellated shorelines of the Bosphorus with locally used crown molding section profiles, commonly used as interior ceiling ornamentation in Istanbul. By collapsing the vertical extrusion of geog geographic information, in this case the shorelines, with the horizontal extrusion of a ceiling ornamental profile, the shorelines become both more tangible and more abstracted at an architectural scale. While utilizing the elemental technique of horizontal and vertical geomet geometric extrusions, the project sets out a new dialogue, as though Super Studio's horizontal extrusion of the New York profile suddenly starts speaking with Ms. van der Rohe's vertical charcoal extrusions. These extrusions required many, many drawings, obviously, and um, uh, we, we drew them all. <laughs> There's nothing else to say, I guess. <laughs> As part of the exhibition, the installation object is also accompanied by the presentation of a, what we call a geographic fiction, a story illustrated through a series of speculative architectural drawings and presented in the form of a silent film. The story depicts an intent in 2025 when Oilella, the fictional biggest oil tanker in the world, gets stuck in the Bosphorus. This incident not only blocks the passageway forever, but also causes the Bosphorus to be transformed into a new land of urban development. In the story, while some structures on the Bosphorus turn into touristic destinations, depicting an archeology span of an oil shipping landscape, new developments take advantage um, of this rapidly urbanizing land. For new construction, while building code get created by taking Oyulala as a guideline for the most historical structure. Famous architects were commissioned for new buildings on this location. And monuments get built com to commemorate previous oil spills on the spot where they were happen. The volume of each monument represents the actual amount of oil spilled during each specific accident. Finally, the installation object of the strait is presented in the film as one of those monuments built to remember the original shoreline that dissolved after the infill. Instead of conceptualizing the environment as purely natural and therefore needing to be preserved and protected, or as merely systemic and needing to be managed and maintained as a problem, Straight project manifests the environment as aesthetic and monumental. By suggesting a non-naturalistic and more monumental conception of the environment, it projects an alternative relationship between geography and architecture, 
one that is slightly unfamiliar. Well, we are about to be done. Um, but um, we wanted to um, close with this um, um, as an epilogue, I, I guess. Um, um, so this is our work um, for the Architecture League exhibition. And for our installation, we wanted to represent um, all our most recent project um, all together over a continuous imaginary landscape. Um, for each project lands onto this territory, this imaginary territory, basically, um, we brought them with their own context in their real world. Um, here, for instance, you see the HRBG uh, building uh, with its streets, uh, the light rail right in front of it, and all the utility boxes even in front of the um, in front of the their in front of their entrance. And then the type of project on the upper left corner starts to appear unexpectedly. And basically, you can start to see all these sort of unexpected relationship in a way, in a, relationships in a way among all these projects throughout, the land, throughout this landscape. Well, in the end, just like a capriccio in painting, where architecture ruins are collected and compressed in an imaginary time and space, we invite the observer to experience and imagine our recent work all together in the landscape of one large drawing. Thank you. Thank you.